Nassim, so nice to see you. Um, Great. Martha has introduced you, but actually she missed on something important. One of the things that she hasn't said about you is that you can make very complicated things understandable. And actually, your books are a pleasure to read because of that. Thank you very much. I'm very honored. But, uh, in, in, uh, you know, in, in my later phase, I'm a little more obscure, but that's okay. Well, since we, I thought we might start with, uh, with having you explain once again, what is the black swan and why this COVID-19 is not a black swan? Remember, we have a very broad audience, not necessarily from the field of risk management or risk detection. And, uh, and I think uh, having an approximation on your own words of what's a black swan would be very, very helpful. Yeah, so the, the idea, the metaphor of the black swan uh, originates apparently, or maybe, uh, you know, maybe it's, it's earlier than that, in ancient Rome, where uh, well, you had the expression, uh, as rare as a black swan. And it was supposed to be something very, very rare. So like, uh, you know, uh, uh, President uh, Trump getting Nobel Prize in physics uh, next November or next October. So that's something very weird. So the idea, uh, I, I formatted uh, a version of it that would be an event that not just rare, but would have uh, um, massive consequences and that you don't see uh, ahead of time, you don't see it coming ahead of mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. But when it happens, Okay, retrospectively, it becomes also explainable, so predictable. So, oh, we, uh, you know, it's so obvious. So that is my version of the black swan. So let's continue now. Is uh, uh, COVID a black swan? So I ask you, d d d you, you, to think that COVID is a black swan, what must have no uh, books, no libraries, and never go to the movies, you see, because there have been movies about this, there are numerous novels about uh, the plague, and also one to think that it's a black swan, like many governments have uh, to be surprised by it. You must absolutely have no um, uh, historical books in your libraries. But you missed the great plague that killed a third of European, the population of, of Europe and, and the Mediterranean. In, in the 14th century, and numerous plagues before, like uh, there have been 72 murderous plagues in history. So basically, you must have absolutely no notion of what happened before uh, 19, uh, uh, 1994, you see. So, so to think that it's a black swan. But, um, go ahead, yes. No, Nassim, but so they may have no notion of history, but yet we've seen governments and businesses totally surprised. So you seem to yes. have some method to this madness. I mean, not only a few years back, you anticipated the financial crisis. Uh, January 2020, you have a paper warning about the depth of this crisis. Uh, so so how come governments and businesses couldn't anticipate it? No, but let, let me tell you why. Well, I mean, it all started in the black swan itself, or I say that it's basically it would be a white swan for the following reason. The Great Plague traveled very slowly, mm -hmm. something like 20 kilometers uh, a day. I mean, it's the time to be, you know, the Compostela Road, yeah, you need yeah. 20 kilometers. 20 kilometers a day, the average. That was pretty much uh, its maximum speed was 30 some kilometers a day. So that's how the, the great plate traveled. And it took somewhere between 150 and 250 years to reach some villages. 250 years, okay. Wow. <laughs> so, and it traveled with commerce along the Mediterranean, the Silk Road, and of course, uh, the northern um, routes in, in, in the summer. So basically, that's what happened then. So what, in the Black Swan, I was very concerned about connectivity, making things today happen much faster than before, and which environments are prone to this. And effectively, what you have today is um, conferences in Las Vegas that bring in uh, 8,000 doctors with the most boring specialties, like say doctors who focus on, uh, I don't know, on the pancreas or something like that, 8,000 of them, they fly in, uh, 
they, 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 they party because really doctors don't go to, to conferences uh, except, you know, to party or meet other doctors, basically. They party. So 8,000 of them, they come from Valladolid in Spain or from Alaska or from, uh, from, uh, from the Philippines, okay? They, they mix. And then they redistribute it. So four days later, you accomplish what you couldn't accomplish in 250 years, okay? And with, with the great plague. So we have... A, uh, a structural uh, misunderstanding of our universe today, we're vastly more connected and the connectivity causes winner-take-all effects. So to give you the, the, the thing that people can easily understand that a, a, a basketball player and a football player made very little money when there was no TV, there was no monoculture, okay, made compared to others and you had a flat structure. Same with opera singers. And then suddenly you had the big media. Now four or five opera singers made all the money. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm saying almost all the money, like something like 90% of the money was made by uh, under 10 opera singers. And then the rest were singing at birthday parties. So you have people making 200 million euros, uh, you know, and, 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 and cumulatively even more like Pavarotti and then other people making, uh, you know, having to work uh, in, in, in Starbucks, okay? So the same thing that winner take all effects also affects diseases. So, so the, the same, whereas in the past you had an ecology of viruses, you know, you'd have epidemics, today now we have a big pandemic. So, the, the, so in, in, uh, when we had Ebola in 2014, 2015, so a group of people of which I'm a member started getting involved and trying to warn people not to make a mistake of, of uh, not taking multiplicated things seriously because a pandemic is multiplicative, you see? And these generate what I call extremistan. And, and that was described in the black swan. I mean, so when, and, and again, the, our problem was not so much the authorities. Our problem was journalists. They were comparing uh, deaths from uh, Ebola, uh, Ebola at a time, and then later on COVID in January, when we were warning, uh, which is very multiplicative to car accidents. They say we should worry more about car accidents. They kill more people. But I was explaining that if I get, if I, if I, or drowning in a swimming pool, okay, something absurdly rare, but that was killed more people than both Ebola and COVID at a time. And then we tell them, listen, if I drown in my swimming pool, odds are, my neighbor drowns in her or his swimming pool, okay, it doesn't change, okay? It will still be one in a million, okay? Mm -hmm. But if I get COVID, odds are that my neighbor gets COVID, okay, is gonna change. So and that there are two different processes, okay, that we should not compare. Multiplicative contagious effect was winner take all and the other ones. And so, actually help us understand and dive deeper into this situation. Rare events that have a, multi yes. a, a multiplicative effect. Yes. And that up until now, when we were all looking at probabilities, we tended to remove the outliers and then, you know, frankly say, this is actually uh, not, it's, it's very likely, it's very unlikely, so let's actually not factor that in. A yes. number of businesses now have to deal with those events that actually have, you know, devastating consequences. How exactly. do how do we, uh, you know, as you know, I you know I work at IE University. How do we help managers and decision makers to factor in uncertainty and factor in those okay. very rare events without going schizophrenic? Okay, so if you ask me what's my favorite book today, it's this one, Statistical Consequences of Fat Tales. Okay, great. And, and why is it my favorite book? Because I, I, I look at the consequences. Let me explain very simply. Your grandmother understands the problem, all right? Your great grandfather understands the problem, all right? My great aunt would have understood the problem. The problem, the fact is, those who study a little bit of statistics, okay, uh, uh, undergo a massive decrease of understanding what's going on. So let me give you an example. I'm, every time you're in Madrid, no, in one of my favorite cities, and I'm in Madrid, I eat a lot. Uh, also, I have squid ink, uh, arroz uh, negro. So I, I don't miss, I eat a lot. How many calories can I eat in a day? 3,000 calories? For example, okay, yeah. So 
over a year, there's, it's, it's, I mean, it's nothing. The bit, I, I mean, I would die. Say I can have 4,000 calories in a maximum, okay? So the maximum I can consume in a day, okay? All this uh, uh, great uh, food and all this belota ham and all of this, okay? I'm going to go on a splurge. It would be maybe 4,000 calories, okay? Maybe five. Okay. Now, for a year, in a year, I consume, what, 800,000 calories, okay? Mm-hmm. So it's not going to make a dent in a year, that variation, Okay. On the other hand, in finance, when I started trading, there was an old fellow who called me up. They come over kiddo, okay? He had a gray, you know, or even white beard, and I had, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, no facial hair. I, mean, I was, I was, I had black hair, all right. Uh-huh. And then so the young, young, he said, okay, he said, look over here. He said, what? You see, you see this guy Ed? It was in a pit trade. I said yes. He said, look at him. He said yes. He said he made. Eight million dollars in eight years, which at the time was a lot of money, okay, and lost them all in eight seconds. You see, so I cannot lose thirty kilos in one second, all right. I cannot gain thirty kilos in one second, but you can lose all your net worth in one second, okay. So what happens is that two different variables. So you have to say this is mediocre stat, this is extreme stat, and everything we've studied. So a black swan is an extreme event for me consuming calories, 5,000. It's not going to make a difference, you see. So no single day. So we yeah. have to distinguish between these two. So practically everything in the business world is driven by the extreme. To give you an idea, 0.2% of companies in America represent half the capitalization. Yeah. The thing Especially these days. Yeah. Okay. If you take the, the, the Jeff Bezos is wealthier cumulatively than the bottom 3 billion people, 3 billion on a planet have less net worth than Jeff Bezos. Okay, so this cannot happen. You cannot have Jeff Bezos heavier physically, you're right, than 3 billion people. But this can happen in that, that domain. So you have to distinguish between the two domains. That was the beginning of my the black swan. I explained, uh-huh. uh, extremist time. And in business school, I tell people, okay, you have scalable professions and non-scalable professions, mm-hmm. okay? If you're a dentist, you can be the best dentist in the history of dentistry, okay? You still got to be able to see no more than 20 clients a day or 20 patients a day, all right? 30, I don't know how many, okay? But if you write a, a book like Harry Potter, you don't have to rewrite it every time someone buys it. You write it once, it's done, and then you can sell a, a you know, billion copies. So the scalable professions are from extremist time. I, I, every time I write a book, you know, the publisher doesn't call me up and say, you know what, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, we have one book to sell. No, it's, I've written it, and that's it. They have the information, and they print. And even better when you sell it electronically, even, even no, no limitation. Whereas, uh, um, whereas a sandwich maker, you have the best caviar sandwich in, in the world, you still have to make them one by one, you see? So that's the problem with these two professions. And I tell people, actually, if you want a good life, go, don't take a scalable profession. Because one person makes all the money and the rest don't. So we shouldn't be aspiring for, for that, you know, 1% of authors or 5% of authors who actually... Uh, uh, yeah, actually, can... for authors, it's the worst, actually. For novelists, uh, planet-wide, I think um, some, something like 10, the top 10, it changes every year, between huh. 5 and 25. But say the top 10 novelists make uh, half the profits. Uh-huh. For so, so I get you. Actually, it's a, great, it's a great point. We have been talking a lot about... Uh, you know, what, what are the professions, the future of work, and what are the, the, the professions of the future and how to train uh, them. So I love your tip around scalable professions for money-making versus, versus quality of life. Um, it's, yes. it's, it's, an excellent, it's an excellent piece of advice. Let me actually, if I may, just uh, continue on the idea of the black swan, but maybe moving on to another concept that I, I really like how you explain it. Um, yeah. It's the word of the concept of fragility, right? You make a distinction between what is fragile that actually breaks when, you know, with, with volatility or chaos or uh, versus what is robust that, you know, something that doesn't break when it's shaken versus a new concept that I think will be very interesting for business 
businesses today, which is how do we think about those opportunities that actually benefit from uncertainty, that benefit from chaos, from volatility? We'd love to hear more about it. We'd love if you could give some examples of how we can um, you know, help managers and, and executives and, and, and entrepreneurs find those anti-fragile uh, opportunities. Okay. So, so once I describe the fragile as something like this uh, coffee cup, right, that doesn't like, or this teacup doesn't like volatility, okay? So if, uh, if I leave it alone, uh, it wants to be left alone. If I leave it alone, over time, something will break, an earthquake eventually will break. It. So, it, 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 uh, so once we define the fragile as doesn't like a certain cluster, that includes volatility. And so therefore, there's a category of things that do like volatility. So, so let me ask you, if you go to the gym? Yes. Okay, so if you go to the gym, uh, the, uh, the, what are you doing to the, in the gym? You are uh, uh, subjecting your body to stressors, no? Uh -huh. To some kind of, okay, so this is a cluster of volatility stressors. You benefit from it. So, we, so here again, like mediocre stand, extreme stand, we have to distinguish between the engineered and the organic, okay? The organic communicates with this environment via stressors. You see, you go in the sun, the, the skin turns, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and darkens as you see, so you upregulate things. So an external, so you see, an external stressor makes you uh, uh, stronger. Okay, like if I and, and to see the difference, the, the main chapter in uh, anti fragile was called on a main difference between a cat and a washing machine, and I was explaining the difference between the organic and the uh, non organic, and it's as follows. If I uh, start banging on a washing machine with my wrist, okay, my bone will get stronger, but the washing machine will break. It's not going to get stronger from if I bang on it, you see. So the organic only communicates with its environment via stressors. You see, evolutionary pressures, all these stressors. So, uh -huh. uh, so once you map these things properly and scientifically, and I spent now the last uh, 10 years working on uh, the scientific aspect of it. The papers are not out. I mean, there've been some published uh, progressively, but not in a volume yet. Uh, the you, you start realizing that there are a lot of things that die when you deprive them of stressors. So your bone, for example, if you go to the space shuttle, okay, spend six months there reading, of course, uh, Cervantes and uh, and all the big authors, and then come back, uh, your bones are going to be weaker. You see. So the, 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 actually the lack of carrying weight has been harming uh, people uh, a lot because mm -hmm. they do exercise, but they won't have weight bearing for their bones. And the bone is uh, something, part of us that needs to be strong because it, it also it, it helps memory and stuff like that. It was, so anyway, so the idea is you need external stressors. Okay. Now, when, when we talk about companies and we talk about economy, is it more like the cat or the washing machine? Okay, so in fact, it turns out that the economy is more like a forest. <laughs> if you make sure it incurs no volatility, a forest that has no fire, uh -huh. guess what happens? If you push every single fire very rapidly, right? I mean, you start accumulating bad materials. So the longer you delay the uh, the 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 the, the bigger the fire, okay, the, the bigger it's going to be, uh -huh. and eventually be like a huge fire. This is what happened in America in 2007, 2008, where they tried to eliminate every single fluctuation. So they kept a lot of sick companies around and, and it's better to fail early than late. Like better have small fires all the time than a big fire later. And we had that big fire later. And, and now the same thing now we have a big fire later. So this is the idea of anti-fragility. And then you can extend to companies. Okay, Companies that have no volatility of earnings usually are more likely to go bankrupt. Okay. People don't realize that. The, 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 uh, I, I use the metaphor of a, two brothers, Cypriot brothers in London. One works for a company and has worked for 35 years. And the other one is a taxi driver and adapts. So one has variable income, the taxi driver, volatility of income. And the volatility of income is information 
You see, you don't make money, you change route, you try to figure out where to go, the airports at night and this like that. Whereas the other one had no information, no feedback from reality because stressors are feedback. Mm -hmm. So made an income for five years and, and, and then laid off. The odds of being hit by a truck are higher than finding a job when you're uh, 58 years old and so on. Whereas the other brother, I continued the story after COVID, okay, by saying, well, well COVID, the brother who's a taxi driver, of course, now becomes a delivery person. These people make sweet time, but they made a, a, a taxi driver. So what happened is that you're getting, if you don't have an income, you have an upregulating stressor that helps you go and, um, and, and find something. Go ahead. Let, let me actually build on this. So yes. in the idea of looking for stressors that make us stronger, the idea yes. of having lots of little fires or being the cab driver as opposed to, um, as opposed to the person who the stable income, how do we get Europe? And I know you're based on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, but how do we get Europe to get more into that habit of, 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 of failing and trial and error and, and, and accepting some yeah. risks, but, but actually knowing that is a small fire as opposed to the, to the big fire that's, like, that's gonna kill the forest. How do we, what specific okay. things could I, uh, Europe do to, to get like into that mindset? The youth. It's changing the culture of the youth, okay? California, okay, has the highest bankruptcy rate in the world. Mm-hmm. Right, Northern California, the Silicon mm -hmm. Valley. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, America has the highest bankruptcy rate. And the higher the bankruptcy rate, the more failures, the more people are trying. It tells you people are trying. They're not just waiting for uh, to imitate uh, someone. Okay, Like in Japan, for example, they don't have a culture of failure. And it helped them to imitate in the beginning to perfect stuff that existed. And, and now, of course, everybody does it. So they, we don't need that anymore. Hence, what's going on in Japan for the last 30 years. So the idea that, that I mean, I was in India and then uh, I realized that they have all the smart people. They send them to Harvard to study economics or something. And I told them, no, you said, smart people should make force them to start companies <laughs> young when, when they have nothing. To lose. So the, I, the problem of, of, of Europe is they don't understand their own history. Their own history, the Industrial Revolution did not happen because people went and studied in Oxford and Cambridge. We, as a matter of fact, we had the steam engine from here of Alexandria, okay? For you had for two millennia, the steam engine was not used. These people were completely illiterate uh -huh. adventurers or nearly illiterate adventurers who started tinkering with things and then they had the industrial revolution going. So the, the history of the, the European, Europe started getting wealthier than the rest of the world in the 16th century, okay? 17th, 18th century. And that came from adventurers who really took risks and engaged in trial and error, not in top-down planning and stuff like that. And you cannot continue with top-down planning. So my rule is as follows, put in the brain of young, people in Europe. You finish your high school, try to start a company. Wow. Make failure respectable, okay? Tell them you're not going to save the world from poverty, okay, by working for an NGO. It may help, okay, but we did not pull 2 billion people out of poverty, okay, okay, using, uh, 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 you know, uh, University uh, thinkers. No, I, I'm a university professor, and I can, and, and you are too. And then we see the limitation. Start a company. This is how you, and this is how we pull people out of, uh, you know, entrepreneurship. Try, and to make people engage in entrepreneurship, you have to make failure acceptable. Absolutely. It is still there is still a stigma against failure. That's that's one 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 major thing. And then also I had another uh, thing about Mediterranean countries uh, that traditionally Mediterranean countries ha were artisanal, mm -hmm. okay? Not heavily industrialized. It's not part of the culture. It's not part of the values. It's not part of the norms. And, uh, and it seems to me that the new environment post COVID is going to be more, allow more of this, this artisanal lifestyle with this uh, work in your village, work at home, stay in a village, don't have this, commuting to the big city. And, and that will probably will give some advantage to Mediterranean. I'm being Mediterranean myself, of course, I'm trying to find a story that makes me feel good, but still there, you can see the evidence that uh, you have some advantage in that environment where you don't have to be in large concentrated cities in the North. 
thanks to remote work coming from COVID. Because COVID, we are anti-fragile to diseases. Let me tell you one thing. If I jump one meter, my bones will get stronger. If I jump 10 meters, I die, okay? But if I jump up, a lot of times one meter, it makes me stronger to handle a two meter jump or three meter jump. What happened with this crisis, COVID, it made us much stronger, okay, for the next pandemic. Now we are in sync with our history. We, unfortunately, we had to spend trillions of dollars to learn something that was obvious, but now we know how to handle, uh, you know, uh, uh, testing. And we started, we're started. starting to handle, and nine months into it, we figured it out. So this will protect us from the big pandemic, just like uh, uh, working out in the gym, okay, protects you from, uh, you know, protects your body from all manner of diseases. I love, I, love, uh, I, I love your recommendations and your prescriptions uh, around uh, encouraging the youth to, 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 to uh, start up and, and, and be more entrepreneurial. Uh, we love, at the institution I represent, we love to do that. And, and we very much uh, build that into their, their, their experiences. Um, it's actually interesting because um, I might uh, sound a little too European and risk averse. Uh, but when you're saying that this pandemic is actually getting us ready, getting us more prepared to the next one, I cannot help but think, well, yeah, duh, but uh, we're on this one now and there's a lot of fatalities. Um, so what else? I mean, and I'm now going to love to take the sort of the position of a, of a business person. And, and, you know, many of them have to make uh, very difficult decisions in in very opaque environments. Um, how do we help them to, you know, be more anti-fragile, to actually be comfortable with the stressors and, 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 and engage on a sort of a learning path? I, I just wanna, I want, I want to go back to that topic because I feel, um, you know, today in the real world, many of those decision makers are actually uh, paralyzed by the level of uncertainty and yet, uh, and the concept of stressor is an interesting one, but um, you know, frankly, when the downside risk is not um, controlled, yes. the, the the situation is is, uh, is 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 difficult to manage. How how would you know? What would you prescribe in, in this uh, for these businesses? The problem is the minute a firm is uh, supervised by the press. Because when you join the stock market, you're going to have journalists supervise your operation, okay? So let's assume that you have two sisters. One sister makes four euros a share, but she has no plenty of downside risk. The other sister makes three euros a share, but has cut all downside risk. It's going to be robust. And you know, in the future, there's no bankruptcy. Whereas the other one has a high bankruptcy risk because of... Uh, bad uh, uh, funding, bad uh, capital structure, bad operations, a lot of risk. One supplier in China, not two. So all kind of matter, right? Mm -hmm. So sort of like uh, what happened to Coca-Cola. They, they start concentrating on one supplier in China, no supplier, oh, they have a problem. Okay, so they have two different, but they're in the same business line. Mm -hmm. uh, the security analyst will favor the $4 a share was going to go bankrupt over the sister who the $3 a share was robust, okay? We can tell what companies are robust. It is very easy. Sometimes you just take a look at a balance sheet, but also you can look at earnings. The company that has high volatility of earnings yet avoids big problems, okay? Fluctuat Negmerge Tour is the robust one. It's exactly the opposite. Okay, like for example, if I get, uh, you know put a band on someone mm -hmm. to measure her or his heart rate over 24 hours, there's one metric that would tell me how long that person will live: volatility of heart rate. Mm -hmm. Exactly the opposite. Not steady heart rate is because it'll be low, and once in a while it jumps when you do exercise and goes back down. So the volatility of heart rate. So it's very simple: volatility of earnings. Okay, under some band, not, 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 nothing huge, volatility of earnings is a greatest piece of information. Like the earning of the taxi driver, some volatility, but not too much, okay, gives you a floor. So if we distinguish between downside risk, 
what I call ruin, risk of ruin. Uh-huh. And a variation. Typically, one, you trade one for the other. When you have no, for example, to me, what's the worst possible company in the world? The worst company you can think of is a company in, say, a developing country that has steady earnings. And you know, when a company has steady earnings in a developing country, it means that they have contract with the government. Okay. So they have big, their supplier is a government. So they get used to that. Okay. Because they're not learning anything because they still have the contract. They don't have to fight, find new things. They still have this. And then one day, Okay, either the government changes or that person who uh, is favoring the company and the government dies, right? Or uh, something happens or someone falls, falls out of favor and then suddenly all that income puff, goes to zero. So this is the standard model of a fragile company that seems to have steady earnings. So, but Nassim, on that example, on the, on the situations you're describing, volatility as, a, volatility as a good thing so long as you avoid the risk of ruin. What sort of things do you look for to know that a company is avoiding the risk of ruin? I, I, you, you look at the balance sheet, okay? Okay. And it's very simple. I mean, there's metrics for stress testing uh, st uh, banks, for example. Uh, I, I did something for the IMF based on acceleration of losses. But it's very simple. You take interest rates, you raise interest rates uh, uh, one point, look at how much they lose if they have to refinance at that rate yep. and then raise interest rates an extra hundred and see if you have acceleration of harm you see and a fragile company is one that has acceleration of harm it may be difficult to explain it right here it's explained both in anti-fragile and in my technical work on on risk of ruin but it, it, to give you a simple idea in the physical world okay i am fragile because if i jump one meter yeah. I'm, I'm hurt much less than a tenth of jumping, uh, 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 you know, uh, 10 meters, okay? Mm -hmm. So I am fragile, you see? So if, if, you, if, I, if someone uh, uh, hits me with 10 kilos, I'd be harmed a lot more than someone hit me a thousand times with a few grams, you see, cumulatively 10 kilos. So if you have acceleration, nonlinearity, that is fragility. And, and typically you can detect it on the balance sheet of companies by seeing how you have accelerated losses. So interest rates go up 1%, it costs them 10 million euros. Interest rates go up 2%, it costs them 30 million euros. Okay, so you have acceleration of harm and you can detect that. There are techniques to do that. Once, once you put it in your head that you're looking for how sensitive a company, how fragile it is to ruin, you will find, you know, you don't need it. You just look at it, you figure out that, that the sister, the sister is a lot more robust than the other one, you see? You can figure out if a company is robust or not based on, on very easy, uh, on debt, structure of debt, and also concentration of suppliers, uh -huh. you see? Okay. Maybe a very idea, let's talk about countries, all right? Spain versus Saudi Arabia, okay? Okay. Saudi Arabia, think of how fragile Saudi Arabia is. It has one source of revenue, whereas Spain has so much. And again, it's a little fragile because too much tourism, but nevertheless, it is more robust. Okay, and, and, and country like Scotland has less tourism, is more robust, and, uh, and country like Norway, you know, or uh, not Nor Norway has resources, Sweden, you see. So you can, look, you can look at, based on concentration of sources of harm and acceleration of harm, how uh, uh, a, a company or a, comp or a country or a district or a city, uh, how fragile they are. And we know based on that, that pre-COVID, that New York City is very, very fragile. And sure enough, look at it. It's, it's not going to recover. Yeah. That's, it's because it's built for... That's right. Please. Because it's built for high volume, okay? And, and the restaurants in New York City are so fragile that in, in Madrid, maybe you can experience a drop of 50% in revenue for a restaurant and still be around. But the structure of New York City and the costs are such that when a, a restaurants go bankrupt, with 15% drop in revenues. It's, it's just, just, yeah, and I wish, I wish our restaurants over here could actually still be in business with a 50% decline. I, I, I really hope so, because that's the sort of thing we're seeing. But on, on this idea of anti-fragility, before we move on to um, the next topic, uh, so stressors are good, volatility, nothing to be afraid of so long as we can actually cut the losses and we're thoughtful about identifying that. 
You see, so, so to give you an idea, if I put weights on my back, yeah. if I put a hundred kilos, it would make my, my bones stronger. Yeah. But if I put a thousand kilos or a ton, okay, I will, you know, you, I'm, I'm gone. There's no more books, no more nothing. All right. I'm gone. Bye bye. All right. So what <laughs> happened is that up to a point, volatility up to a point. Okay. Volatility. So no, don't, and, and we don't want you to have, a, you know, a hundred kilos on you, but uh, just uh, do, can you think or can you share with us any good examples of antifragile businesses that are actually now emerging, uh, you know, in the current yes. environment? Yes. Yeah, so, so the way I've classified, uh, without looking at antifragile classification, let's look at uh, this specific source of harm, namely COVID. Okay. okay. You have four types of companies. Companies that are harmed uh, uh, permanently. Mm-hmm. Okay. And that's business travel, okay, or New York City, conference centers in New York City. They're harm, uh, 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 physical conference centers, not conferences. They're harmed permanently because COVID changed the way people behave now and have meetings. So a lot of meetings will be in physical space, but a lot of them will be in uh, in virtual space, yeah. okay, like, like, this, like this one. It's working. So you, you would imagine that a post-COVID era – COVID gave us a shock, as, as it says in the Talmud, God, God gives us a cure first and then gives us a disease. Mm-hmm. Luckily, we had the internet before this COVID. We're so lucky. Okay, so, so that's the first class of companies, all right? Companies that are harmed permanently. That's the fragile one. Like New York City is going to be harmed permanently because you don't need to, you, know, you need to be there maybe one day a week, not that much. Yep. So... Uh, the second category, more robust, uh, they were harmed, but temporarily, and that's a dentist, okay? I mean, I've been delaying going to a dentist or hair, as you see, I don't have a lot of hair, but I still need someone to cut my hair. These are, temp- so these are robust. So robust, but lost, okay? Uh-huh. You have uh, the, the ones that benefited from COVID, some we think is permanent and some is temporary. The ones who benefited permanently, simply like Zoom, Okay, uh, and and you're gonna have a switch for airlines who are based on business travelers, like most U.S. airlines here, mm-hmm. are uh, are gonna suffer. Tourism will come back, so don't worry about Spain. Tourism will come back. The first thing I want to do when COVID is over is get on a plane. All right. <laughs> yes. So I've already cheated. Uh, you know, the, 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 I've been going on planes. All right, without you know uh, making it too much noise about it. But okay, so. Tourism will come back, but conferences will not, okay? Will come back maybe in a reduced form. So, and, and business meetings will not. So airlines that are made uh, like cheap airlines to transport a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, people from the North to go to the Mediterranean will make money, you see? Will actually make more money than before. But companies design where the business, tra- like New York, London route, where the business travel is subsidizing mm-hmm. the back of the plane, Will, will, will fail. And effectively, we're seeing that already. So, and then you have companies that, so companies that, that will benefit permanently from it, technology. You see all the jobs, we see pick up in jobs in America. Yeah, yeah. You see, unemployment has been reduced every, uh, almost every, uh, every time, every month, a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. it's still significant. Mm-hmm. But these are not all jobs coming back. Mm-hmm. Many of them are new jobs. Totally. It's created during COVID, largely by technology, <laughs> you see. Yeah. Yeah. Delivery companies, if you deliver, uh, like Amazon, if you deliver stuff, you're hiring people, you see. If you're in, if you're a professor in a, in a virtual space, you, you, you're doing very well, you see. Traditional U.S. education is based on this big framework that requires a lot of physical space, is very costly, and has so many administrators. It became like metastatic bureaucracies, okay, will suffer. But education doesn't have to be that way, Absolutely. you see? Exactly. So you can teach online. And I know we have the seminar, okay, where we give a degree sort of like uh, what you do is a practical uh, risk seminar, a bunch of friends and I. And usually in a physical world, we used to attract 50, 60 people. Today, okay, we have 600 on a waiting list. Yeah. 600. But so let, let me give you another anecdote. Maybe people will get it. Of, of the two different kind of people with COVID and with two friends of mine. A friend of mine owns a gym in California. And you see the heaviest hurt business is a gym. Okay. Mm-hmm. So 
So instead of sitting down and praying and getting money from the government and crying, he started the business of equipping people with home gyms. And he made a fortune. So you call him up, you want a home gym, he sets it up, sends you the material, go on, you know, uses Zoom to train you and, and, and okay. So, so you have these category of people who whenever they're hit with something, they actually go in and try to find ways and it makes them upregulate, you see? is what I call post-traumatic growth. And this we see with countries, this we see with a lot of people. Or another example is waiters in New York. They're two kind. Those who cry waiting for you know, something to come back and, 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 and crying and waiting for the government and praying and hoping. And people who took things in their own hand and turned into delivery people. You made, they made three times the income because, uh, because so many people like old people in New York City, right? Old, very old uh, people could not go out, okay? And needed everything, right? You buy two space for them, everything, and then put it in, in sterilized packages on their, on their uh, doormat. So it, it is, it is, it's incredible how you can find business on, in a crisis that didn't exist before and make money from it. So these, this class of people, all right, is what's making the world advance because the, COVID is a big shock, but every day you have a micro shock somewhere, you see? And this is a way to think about it, to look at these heroes, because these are the heroes that are really helping others, you see? And the fellow who's equipping home gyms realized that there is a shortage of plates for weightlifters. And he started the factory making plates. <laughs> I, love, I love all your examples about uh, how this very uncertain and, 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 and difficult situation is, is also filled with opportunities for those who actually want to take it and belong to that uh, fourth category that you described. So hopefully the audience is, uh, um, you know, already thinking about uh, how to take a different lens on what's, uh, what's going on. Let me move on to um, a final topic that I wanted to discuss with you. Um, some education institutions like ourselves are very worried about the concept of building a 60 or 70 year curriculum and really truly uh, being there for um, you know, citizens and learners and throughout uh, their lifetime. It looks like um, you know, my kids might actually leave 100 years and, and uh, from the time they finish college to the time they retire, um, yes. probably, probably, just probably, whatever they learned in college is not going to be enough to keep them productive uh, for, for that long a time. So we need to figure out other ways of actually uh, supporting uh, people in, in longer careers. And I know in the U.S., you know, in Europe, we have our, our retirement age somewhere around 67, 68, maybe 70 in, in certain countries. I know in the U.S., um, lacking anything else, people might actually work until 80 and 85. Um, but till, till it, the I mean, I know a trainer who's all uh, there's no limits uh, in America. Well, I, I know, I know, I know. I just uh, kind of want to bring the, 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 the um, open the window yes. of possibilities for many of our audience who are actually listening from, from Europe. But in this concept of a, a longer life that needs to be, um, you know, richer and productive, and certainly the concept of changing. Uh, chapters is uh, is an important one, and I couldn't help but notice that uh, that you have also had uh, some distinct chapters. Can I start with yeah, I, with I, with maybe just I, a personal? Back, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Nassim. Why I don't like the educational system. I started as a trader, okay, and while a trader, I decided to start doing mathematics, okay because I had no appetite for things I have appetite for later. So as a trader, all right? So I spent some 20 years doing this and then suddenly, and then I got a doctor, okay? So having, if I started with a doctorate, I'd view the world theoretically. Now I see a lot more, okay? I see what makes sense or what doesn't make sense, okay? So I started with scary. So, and then after a trade, then become an author, okay? So went from, trader to studying to becoming an author and then at eight when i turned 50 i decided to become a mathematician full-time <laughs> so it is a, a professionally so it is a, or do something an applied mathematical statistician so it is it is technical and usually people do that in reverse so i realized why because i had the chance to have both free time and control of my life 
And I think that any, a lot of people could do that. I mean, if you work uh, uh, as a uh, uh, construction, I mean, if you have a menial job that's a few hours that gives you so many hours during the day that you can really change career. And a lot of people have the chance today to do it. In the past, by age 14, life was decided for you. Today, much less so, and especially in the United States. Nassim, I'm being told that, uh, unfortunately, we have to cut this short because I'd love to hear more about, um, the, 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 you know, the, the, what you were talking about now. But uh, Nassim, let, let, let me just pause here. Uh, hopefully, I can continue this conversation at some other point. And thank you okay. again for sharing your knowledge and your experience with the Enlighted audience. Thank you. I'm extremely honored. Uh, thank you very much. And I uh, hope uh, we'll continue. Uh, there are so many points to continue later. I hope so. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks.